Howdy everyone, my name is Dr. Rob Parks and this lecture series is very similar to my lecture series uh, for ASTR 103 but this is going to cover strictly stars, galaxies, and the universe and it's going to cover it in a little bit more depth than I did in the 103 lecture series. With these lecture uh, series, these slides, I have taken from the textbook 21st Century Astronomy by K. et al. It is a wonderful textbook. I highly recommend um, if you are interested in studying astronomy and you have a few uh, few bucks to throw around, I highly, uh, highly encourage you to get this textbook. It is one of the better ones I have uh, found out there. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about stars. Specifically, what are the principal properties of stars and how do we actually measure them? Now, if you look up in the night sky, you might notice that not all of the stars appear white. Uh, most of them will, um, but a few will appear red or blue. And actually, this is a great test for your, uh, dis the, your ability to distinguish colors of very faint objects, or relatively faint objects. Let's look at the constellation of Orion, for example. In the upper left, we have the star Betelgeuse, which is what we refer to as a red giant, or rather more specifically, a red supergiant. And as you can see, it is definitively red, orangey in color. And then you have the bottom right um, is Rigel, which is, also, which is a blue uh, supergiant, and it is blue in color. Now, in this, this is obviously a, a, a astrophotography, an image taken by a telescope. Uh, in reality, if you were to look up the Orion Nebula, all of the rest of these stars, which appear blue, except for Rigel and uh, Betelgeuse, those would actually appear white to your, uh, to your eye, or at least they appear white to me. So these two stars are essentially the, the opposites, uh, or the the rather the range of colors that you would expect to see uh, from red on one end to blue on the other. So one of the questions we're going to one of the questions I hope to answer for you is why do stars have different colors? Why do these? Why is one star? Why is Betelgeuse red? Why is Rigel blue? Now. Why do we study stars? More specifically, what, what are the questions that I hope to be able to answer for you in this lecture? Um, one of the things is, what are the actual brightness of the star? This question is vital for understanding how the star is structured, uh, how the nuclear fusion within that st uh, star uh, operates, and ultimately how that uh, star is going to evolve uh, from its present state. So we want to know what the, uh, the actual brightness or intrinsic luminosity of the star is. When we collect light, and as I am fond of saying, astronomy, about 90-95%, it's my own hand wavy estimate, about 90-95% of astronomy knowledge comes from the collection and study of light. Obviously, we cannot move these objects with into, a, uh, into a lab and uh, manipulate them anyway. So we have to be very clever as to how we analyze this light in order to get the information that we want from very fundamental things such as intrinsic luminosity, their mass, their radii, to more, uh, more in-depth questions like how do, the, how do the magnetic fields of the sun compare to what we refer to as uh, active stars, how do those two magnetic fields, how are they generated, uh, what are their life cycles, and so forth. When we talk about stars, one of the first things that was done, at least from an academic standpoint, uh, was to come up with a classification system for stars. Prior to the turn of the, century, turn of the 1900s, uh, really the only classification of stars was based on their brightness. It was only until after the 1900s that we came up with a more physical represent or more physical rationale for determining the classes of, of stars. And then finally, we're going to be determining uh, just what the actual factors involved uh, that 
create the luminosity or are responsible for the luminosity, temperature, and size of any particular star. Now, three of the most basic, basic parameters that we can measure are stellar distance, brightness, and intrinsic luminosity. Now, brightness is uh, apparent basically how bright does it appear in the night sky. Two other words that I might be, uh, will be throwing around later on is apparent magnitude, that is equivalent to brightness. And then absolute magnitude, that is equivalent to luminosity. Now, apparent brightness is actually fairly trivial to measure. We can do that fairly easily uh, with a CCD camera. Stellar, uh, stellar distance it's a little tr uh, trickier. We actually have a number of ways to determine stellar distance from uh, the most, or the most, I won't say simplest, but the one that uh, allows us to determine the distances to stars within our galaxy, uh, trigonometric parallax, all the way up to uh, determining the distance to the farthest reaches of the universe using the Hubble, uh, Hubble law or uh, super one, type 1a supernova. Intrinsic luminosity is perhaps the most uh, indirect measure. We can measure it, but typically what we have to do is we have to measure something else and then essentially interpret the luminosity from, those, uh, from that observation. So for example, when we look at, uh, in order, if you want to know what the intrinsic luminosity of something is, uh, you, one way to do it is to look at, if it's a pulsating variable, you can use a period luminosity relationship. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, for most other stars, we take a spectra of the star and we look at uh, the lines which represent the individual elemental components of the stars. And based on their characteristics, we can, uh, we can measure out a, or calculate out a, a luminosity. So, speaking of distance, oh, and we're also, and I'm going to also um, point out that stellar distance, brightness, and luminosity are all intrinsically uh, related to each other, or all explicitly related to each other. So, how do we determine distance? Um, like I said, we, we have this thing called a cosmic distance ladder. Now, the first rung on that ladder actually is radar finding. We actually send radar pulses out to an object. It reflects off that object and it comes back and because the speed of light is a constant, we can then determine the distance by timing how long it takes uh, for that signal to get back to us. That's really only viable within the, within the confines of our solar system and I would argue probably within the confines of uh, the inner part of the solar system from prior inward of the asteroid belt. If we want to look at anything beyond that, if we want to look at uh, anything, particularly stars, anything beyond this uh, solar uh, solar system, we have to use trigonometric parallax. It's the one um, one rung up. And I do apologize for my phone ringing. Uh, I get a lot of robocalls, and I haven't figured out how to turn off the ringer yet. So, please bear with me. Now, one of the crucial things about the cosmic distance ladder is that one rung is based off of or calibrated off of the previous rung. So for example, what we can do is we can use a radar finding to say measure the, the distance to an asteroid. We can then use trigonometric parallax, which I'll describe momentarily, and also determine its distance. And then we can compare those distances or distances from two independent different methods. And if they are the same, um, then, great, we can use trigonometric parallax as a viable uh, option for determining distances. Obviously, we would do this for a very large sample size so that, you know, it's not just a one-off. We experience parallax pretty much every day. Um, so if you were to, one form of parallax is if you're in a car, and, and this is uh, really a crucial element of par parallax, if you're in a car and you're driving down um, a highway at a, a fairly good clip, what you'll notice is, or rather, any clip, what you'll notice is that the things closest to you are just whizzing by. They're moving by you very, very quickly. Things in the middle ground 
are moving by at a low, slower velocity, or slower speed, but they are moving at an appreciable rate. Thing, if you can see something in the background, like distant mountains or something of that nature, then what you'll notice is that those things are hardly moving or don't appear to be moving at all. And so that relationship allows us to get to the distance. And it's a fundamental quantity in that the, the, when it comes to parallax, the closer something is, the larger the parallax we're going to see, the farther away something is, the smaller the parallax we're going to see. So what I'd like you to do, if you'd like, is hold up your thumb towards some object distance. I'm going to do it with the, cam or with the camera. And then close your eye. And so when you look at it with both eyes open, you'll have an approximate uh, view of where your thumb is, is pointing. Now, while focusing on the distant object, close one eye. And then close the other. What hopefully you'll notice is that your thumb appears to move from left to right. Ah, just checking something. Uh, incidentally, if you are, uh, if you uh, like shooting, for example, uh, the the eye where the thumb does not appear to move appreciably, that's your shooting eye. That's your dominant eye. Anyway, so again, this illustrates another basic I or basic idea or concept within parallax is you need a baseline. You need two observations that are separated by some distance. And for us, the, the eyes are. And this allows us actually, from a biological perspective, this is why we have spec or we have 3D vision. This is why we have depth perception. It allows us, uh, as predators, uh, it allows us to determine the distances to prey and be able to more, uh, or be better equipped to actually catch said prey. Now, let's bring this into the astronom an astronomical context. So let's say we have star that we're interested in. And uh, so star A, let's ignore star B for a moment. So star A is the red one. And we have, and star A is, in, uh, is within a cluster of stars, uh, which we refer to as background stars. Now, most stars, using this method, most stars really uh, do not appear to move. And we use those as references. What we find is that, in the simplest case, if you take an observation, uh, say, today, what you'll notice is that, in relation to those background stars, star A is on the far right. If you wait six months and you take a, another image of that field, what you'll notice is that star A appears to be shifted over to the left. That is what we refer, the angle which that moves over, that subtends on the sky, is what we refer to as the parallactic angle. And that's ultimately how we get the distance. Now, let's take um, star B. Star B is twice as far away from uh, star A. It's the, the blue star. And what we notice is that, again, if you take an observation today, you'll notice that star B is in a particular location relative to a background field. If you take an observation uh, six months later, what you find is that star B has moved over to the, uh, over to the side and it has done so by half as much as star A. So now we know that there is a linear relationship between, a direct linear relationship between parallactic angle and uh, distance away from this. So the farther, uh, if you have a star that is twice as far away, you're going to have a parallactic angle that is half as much, three times a third, uh, a third as much. Now, doing this in practice is a lot more complicated. Um, I have friends who do this for a living, and they, they would sort of balk at this. You actually need a whole lot of observations. And what you actually find is that uh, the stars are, when we talk about the orbit, uh, this is a star that is ultimately within the plane of our, of our orbit. Most stars are not, and so essentially instead of uh, moving from uh, left to right in a line, they actually move in ovals. But getting ahead of myself. In this case, I uh, also want to mention, in this case for observations on, well, really any trigonometric observation taken from the Earth, you have a baseline of 2 AU, or 2 astronomical units, or 
two times 149 million kilometers. I can't be arsed to actually do the math on that. Uh, around 300. So as I said, um, parallax is the apparent change of position, and this is the. This says it's the only direct way. Oh well, it is. The, it is the only direct way to measure the distance to a star. Uh, obviously, you can't do it with. Um, with radar finding, uh, and what am I? What I mean by direct is that you take a single measurement, and you immediately can calculate what the uh, what the what you're looking at, what you're going after. In this case, you measure a parallactic angle, you get a distance at the back end. So, um, again, this is also kind of explaining um, what we're looking at, and so. We have this is basically throwing some math at it, but it really uh, re it. Uh, what's the room? I'm losing my words today. It is reiterating what I've uh, previously said in that if you have um, a, that parallactic angle is related to distance. Now you might be wondering where uh, the term parallax comes from, or parsec. Sorry, parsec comes from, particularly if you're a Star Wars fan. Uh, you know that so Han Solo did the Kessel Run in, I think it's 12 parsecs. Parsecs is not a time. Parsec is a distance. And so you can hand wave black holes and all that. But anyway, that's the sign. The relationship, if you have, if you put these things in the right, right um, units, arc seconds for parallactic angle and parsec as distance, the equation becomes very simple. It is uh, the parallactic angle is equal to one over the distance. So parallactic angle in arc seconds is equal to one over uh, the distance in parsecs. And so that is what we do. We, have, we, um, we take these measurements and we measure these parallactic angles and they give us uh, the, uh, the distances on back end. Now, how far can we see with this? Well, thankfully, we can thank the Europeans for setting up a, a telescope by the name of Gaia. And Gaia has taken uh, parallactic measurements uh, for some time now uh, for millions of stars within uh, our galaxy. Gaia's, Gaia's precision is so, uh, so good, so precise, precision, uh, precision is so small that it can measure the tiniest little bit of uh, tiniest little bit of shift for stars on the opposite side of our galaxy. Now, previous to that, we were uh, really limited from ground-based observation. We were really limited to about uh, 300 or 100 parsecs or so. And now we are tens of thousands of parsecs uh, away. So we have uh, we have Gaia to think about. It. Uh, that is a telescope that is orbiting around the the earth something else i wanted to say there but now i'm just rambling so what about distance brightness and luminosity again you have um oh that's what i was going to say the reason why there is a limitation to trigonometric parallax why guy can only go out to the solar the galaxy and not say determine distances out to other galaxies is because, as hopefully is obvious, the farther away a star is, the smaller the parallactic angle. And so Gaia is limited by how small a parallactic angle it can measure given the error that is associated with those measurements. And so trying to find, out, find the distances to other stars, uh, in, or stars in other galaxies, that parallactic angle is going to be tiny, and particularly in comparison to the um, com compare, particularly in comparison to uh, the Gaia telescope. If we could develop a telescope that had even greater precision, maybe it would be possible to determine, say, the distance using parallax to Andromeda. But thankfully, we have other methods at our disposal. So, speaking of distance. Now that we have an estimate of distance, or we can have an estimate of, of or we now have a direct measurement of distance, at least within our, um, within our own galaxy, let's talk about how that's related to brightness and luminosity. So 
as I said, luminosity or the intrinsic brightness of something is really just how it, pardon the repeated use, how intrinsically bright something is. Example I like to give is a flood lamp comparison to a star. Now, obviously, the flood lamp is putting out a lot more energy, it's putting out a lot more light, its intrinsic luminosity is much higher. The candle is or much higher than the candle, which is uh, putting out far less energy and is uh, f not nearly, is, is not nearly as, uh, as bright or intrinsic luminous. So obviously, if they're sitting on the desk, the flood lamp is going to be so bright that you probably can't see the candle at all. But you can imagine that if you took that flood lamp and you sent it uh, far enough back, if you put it at a sufficient distance, then the brightness of the candle and the brightness of the flood lamp would appear to be equal. And so that is really the, the, the relationship between, roughly speaking, the relationship between these three quantities is that um, the distance is, let me see if I get this right, the brightness is, the apparent brightness of something is Sorry, I'm trying to work this out so I don't uh, mislead you. Uh, for some reason, I, I am... Uh, it, let me just walk through this. For some reason, I, I am uh, fuzzing on this. My apology. So, the further away something is, the dimmer it's going to appear. The, uh, the larger... Ah, that's what it is. So, the brightness is equal to, or approximately equal to, the luminosity divided by the distance um, squared. And so, farther something away, uh, something, oh, some farther something is away, the dimmer it's going to appear. The more luminous, intrinsically bright it is, the brighter it's going to appear. So, again, this is just showing that a... Um, that one star may, uh, when you look at two stars in the night sky, and they appear to be one is one is bright and one is dim, that is not to say that they are not intrinsically the same luminosity. That they, if you put them right next to each other, they would glow with the same brightness. It could be that those two stars are at uh, disparate distances from each other, or it could be that the brightness is intrinsic. That you, the brighter object is in fact just more luminous than the uh, the dimmer object. Uh, a colleague of mine liked to say that every star that you see in the night sky is superfluous in some way or another. Either it is intrinsically very luminous, or very close. Yeah, it is intrinsically very luminous, or it's very close in order for us to be able to see it. So. The actual calculation here is um, luminosity is equal to the uh, 4 pi distance squared times brightness. That is, if you wanted to calculate, if you knew, if you know the distance, which again with trigonometric parallax is a direct measurement, if you know the brightness, which again is a fairly trivial thing to do with uh, modern CCDs, you can then immediately get the, uh, the luminosity uh, from it. Or you can do a couple different ways. A couple different things. So this is one of the, one of the uh, rungs on the distance ladder is spectroscopic, uh, spectroscopic parallax. And the way that that works is using spectroscopy, you can determine the intrinsic luminosity of a star. You then measure the brightness of that star and you rearrange this equation and you get distance uh, from it. And so, not that you would ever really need to, but uh, in an analogous way, if you know the intrinsic luminosity and you know how far away the star is, you can measure how bright it is, but considering how trivial that is to measure, I don't know why anyone would. So, oh. this lecture brought to you by Waterloo Water. Hopefully I don't run into any copyright issues with um, 
with uh, YouTube. So luminosity is uh, usually expressed in terms of solar units or solar luminosities, and actually you're going to see this a lot. You know, when we talk about lumin uh, luminosities or or uh, temperature or masses or radii, we typically do so in comparison to uh, the sun. It's just easier. The, n the numbers are uh, much smaller uh, than they would be if you talked about the actual luminosity of the, uh, of the star in, say, energy units. So when we look at the stars, when we look at these stars, what we notice is that there is a um, fairly smooth curve for most stars, uh, most adult stars that we see, and then there is a um, there is a very large drop off or a very large uh, decline in actually this is I I cut that off so the well, y axis here is a uh, relative number of stars and the x axis is stellar luminosity what this plot really means is that there are a whole lot of stars that have uh, stellar luminosities that are comparable to or lower than the sun. That's the upper part of the curve. The lower part of the curve is telling us that for star, uh, there are stars that are very, that can be exceedingly uh, luminous, like a million times the luminosity of the sun, but there are very, very few of them. In, in number, in approximate numbers, for every star that is a million times uh, the, uh, the luminosity of the sun, you have approximately 200 stars that have luminosity is about one over a thousand the luminosity of the sun one over ten thousand uh, the luminosity of the sun do, do, do. Ah, crud i've lost this lecture is going swimmingly uh, let's see here um, let's try that all right let's see if we can get this going all right, how do we determine the temperature of things, uh, particularly in a more direct way? Now, in a previous, uh, in the one, uh, I would recommend, uh, if, you ha if you don't already uh, know about spectra, I would highly recommend that you go to uh, my ASDR 103 lecture on light uh, for a uh, sort of tutorial on spectra. Now, what were black body curves or yes black body spectrum in short a black body spectrum is going to have a peak it goes from fairly low um, fairly low energy peaks up to a, uh, the brightest or highest energy and then it drops off uh, with a tail it's roughly Gaussian ish um, and what we do is we measure the the peak lumen uh, the where the peak of that curve is in wavelength and what that tells them, there is a direct relationship, or a direct in, or there's a or inverse relationship that is known as Wien's law, and that is that the temperature of an object, be it any object really, uh, but in this case stars, uh, the temperature of the uh, the object is equal to some constant, uh, in this case 2.9 million, uh, divided by that peak wavelength. In this uh, in this case, the wavelength is measured in nanometers, or one billionth of, an, uh, of a meter. So it's very easy to, to do that. Uh, another sort of co consequence of this is that hotter objects appear bluer than cooler objects, which is really the wrong way around, or different way around, than we see, it on, uh, see on the Earth. So remember, astronomically speaking, hotter is bluer, colder is redder. So when we look at, um, so a spectrum, just to sort of uh, reiterate this, is based on how much energy is coming from the star as a function of wavelength, or what is the intensity of the star as a function of wavelength. And so when we look at the spectrum, what we can do is a spectrum is taking the, the light from that star and ultimately splitting it uh, over fi uh, finer wavelength scale. So we can actually measure the brightness of, say, that spectrum in the 400 nanometer range, and we can measure that spectrum in the 700 nanometer range and all across that uh, 
uh, that region, and we get this black body curve. In reality, these black body curves are not smooth, as the upper figure would uh, have you believe. These curves are far more complicated. There are features involved which um, have to do with absorption lines. Uh, absorption lines are caused by particular, al uh, particular elements within the gas which absorb that energy and then radiate it off in some random direction which we can't see. And so we have these dips in the, the intensity which correspond to very specific energies and also correspond to very specific transitions of, el uh, of electrons within that, uh, that element. Again, for a better understanding or a better description or more in-depth description of it, uh, please see my ASTR 103 lecture on light. So, now let's go back to the early 1900s. Uh, this is a period of, of astronomy that I actually really dig. Um, it's one of my, when it comes to astronomical history, I really like it. So around the ni uh, 1900s, uh, Edward, Pickering, Edward Pickering was the director of the Harvard Observatory, and he needed, because of a certain set of circumstances, he was acquiring a large amount of astronomical data. Now, this is obviously before the time of, of desktop computers. So he needed the analog version of that. And so he hired uh, about a dozen or so women to act as computers. They took this data, they extracted information from uh, the photographic plates this day on this, the stellar data was on, and they did a number of uh, very fundamental and very ground uh, ground groundbreaking pieces of work. One of these the pieces of work was to look at the spectral types of stars. So, again, before this time, we really did not have, spectroscopy was known and it was done, but it wasn't done at this scale. And so given this amount of data, uh, we can, they could now ask a fun, uh, certain questions like, is there any rhyme or reason to this? Is there any physical, uh, a underlying astrophysical reason for why one spectra looks different from another? Now the first attempt at this was done uh, by looking at the absorption lines of hydrogen, essentially how much hydrogen, or how much energy the hydrogen atom in this in these stars, how much of that, how much energy is its deter, uh, its capturing. So, in that uh, in that system, we had an A star was the star or were, uh, were the spectrum that contained the strongest hydrogen lines, meaning that. Uh, hydrogen was uh, absorbing more energy than any other type of star, and that went from A to Z. Unfortunately, that system was very, very complicated, and it really didn't, despite the fact that there was, uh, you know, it was based on the absorption of hydrogen, that wasn't, that's really not a basic astrophysical reason. Because you then ask the question, why does hydrogen why does hydrogen change its amount of absorption from one star to another? A more fundamental property, uh, which was which was understood by any jump cannon, was the spectra. The difference in these spectra actually corresponded to difference in temperature, and so she simplified the model and she reorganized them in terms of overall intensity of these of these spectrum um, and using Wien, or rather using Wien's law she, she let me backtrack that a second she organized these based on the peak wavelength of these stars and uh, from Wien's law was able to come to the temperature of it and she reorganized them so that we have O is the hottest star then B, then A, then F, then G, then K, and then M. These spectral times can then be subdivided uh, based on uh, essentially just how much uh, a more precise change in the wavelengths. And these go from, typically, these go from um, uh, 9 all the way up to 0. The only exception to this is the O stars that only goes up to about five, that only goes up to five. 
So an A9 star, for example, is cooler than an A0 star. And you can see here that you have a, different, uh, a variety of different spectra. You have spectral type on the right. You have the corresponding surface temperatures of these stars on... Oh, sorry. You have spe spectral type on the left. You have uh, surface temperature on the right. The sun is a G2, uh, G2 star. Now, the spectral types uh, can get far more complicated than this uh, and actually get into M, uh, MK types, MK, MK spectral types, which also incorporate the luminosity of the stars. And I'll um, speak more about that in, uh, in a second. So, when we, so going back to that idea of the hydrogen atom, why is it that the A stars are, the hydrogen lines are very well defined, whereas they peter off in the O stars and they peter off um, to cooler elements? The reason for this is related to temperature. It's related to how much energy this hydrogen atom is exposed to. Now, the hydrogen can only absorb certain amounts of energy. If the energy is, shall we say, lower, if the predominant amount of energy is lower than what it can absorb, the hydrogen atom is going to ignore it. And so it's not going to absorb anything. If the energy is higher, what happens is that the electron, which is ultimately what is responsible for absorbing that and re-releasing that energy, that electron gets thrown out. It no longer is bound to the, the proton. So when the electron gets uh, thrown out and all you're left with is the, uh, the nucleus, the proton, there's nothing to actually do any absorbing. So again, the, the hydrogen lines get weaker. So that explains, uh, so what we, that is referred to as photoionization when the electron goes flying off. Um, for stars hotter than uh, A, photoionization is the reason why these hydrogen lines are weaker. For stars that are, uh, that are cooler than, uh, that are cooler than A stars, the amount of energy that they're putting out is just, isn't enough, or is not as, uh, not as, uh, there's not enough energy there to actually be absorbed by the hydrogen, and that gets worse as you get, uh, go down in spectral times. What's even cooler about this, <laughs> pun intended, is that as you go to M stars, one of the things we notice is that, you know, in the, uh, for hotter stars, we got hydrogen, we got helium, we got a little bit of oxygen, maybe, some nitrogen, you know, kind of lower elements. When we get to when you get to M stars, you're talking about um, uh, you're talking about heavy, basically molecules. Before you're talking about uh, there are individual elements, just atoms floating around. Maybe molecules like H2 or uh, eight, uh, or helium two uh, that are two elements that are bonded together. When you get down to M stars, these thing, these suckers are so cool on their surfaces that you can have molecules, very heavy molecules, you know, flying around like titanium oxide, um, and you get a lot of different absorption lines based on. Not now you have absorption not only based on the movement of electrons within the um, within the atom, but uh, different energies will actually cause these uh, these molecules to vibrate in different ways, and so you get lines on top of that. And so that's why the M stars, the spectra of M and K stars look so com more complicated than the stars that are uh, O and B type stars. Um, what we can do from this, or what we can get from, one of the things that we can get from this, is we can measure this as, because Wien's Law tells us that the bluer the star, the hotter it is. We have a we have a way to use this as a proxy. Spectroscopy is a great method. It's a great observational tool. But it is observationally expensive. It, you need a lot of time in order to collect enough light to get a, uh, get a sufficient spectra to do this work. Uh, and you're, somewhat, you're more limited to the brightness of the objects. So you can only, you can only do brighter objects say in comparison to photometry, which is a much simpler uh, method to, uh, to gather information. It's literally measuring the brightness of things on a CCD image. So what I was told that that was the trivial method that I was talking about before. So if you, are, if you have a star 
and you cannot get a decent spectrum of it, or you cannot get uh, telescope time to get a decent spectrum of it, you can, and, and you're still interested in the temperature, you can use something known as a color index, or essentially a color. And what this is, is that photometry uses different filters. It filters out the light of, so a blue filter or a B filter only looks at the light in the blue part of the uh, black body curve or spectrum. A V or visual or green uh, filter measures or allows only the, the green light, the greenish yellow light to pass through. All the other long colors are blocked. And then you have R, which is red, and that just obviously allows red light through. And you can measure the brightnesses of a star in blue, in V, in R, and you can create what is known as a color index, uh, such as B minus V or uh, V minus R. And what we do here is you're literally taking the amount of energy that you get in the B filter and you're subtracting off the amount of energy in the red filter or, or the visual filter or doing the same thing with V and R. This color index can be used as a proxy for temperature. It is not nearly as precise as a spectroscopic measurement, but uh, it can it can get you there, depending on what type of, what is your, uh, what sort of error bars you need uh, for your uh, particular bit of science. So I've already talked about the absorption lines are indicative of the elemental, of the elements within the, uh, within the, within the star, and the lines correspond effectively to how much energy is involved to produce those lines. We can, the first thing that we can do from these spectra is we, uh, as I've said, you can get the luminosity from these and the temperature from these uh, spectra. But to a first order, the first thing that immediately pops out, obviously, are the lines. That then tells you what's on the surface of this star. And we can then use that to uh, infer, to determine how much of this element is in the star itself. And so when we look at the composition of stars on average, what we find is, as a percentage of mass, hydrogen comp uh, comprises roughly 75, uh, helium is roughly 74, and the, or 24, and then all of the other elements, every element that you see around you really, um, corresponds to uh, less than 1% of the, or 1% or less of the total star. And this goes back to what, uh, how the universe is created. When the universe was created, it only created hydrogen, helium, and lithium. All other elements were not, were not made. Um, those are the only three fundamental elements. So therefore, all of the stars, all of the constituents uh, that were created from the, uh, from the beginning are com primarily composed of hydrogen and helium because that's the predominant elements in the universe. We get the heavier elements because of uh, these are created within the hearts of stars and also in uh, the hearts, as it were, of supernovae, which I'll get into. Uh, later on. So you can see that most of the elements that we see around us that we think are fairly common, astronomically speaking, really aren't. So how do we get the, the size of stars? We can really do this two ways. Um, and I don't have a, a slide for this because for some reason the book doesn't go over this, which I think is a shame. There's a technique um, called stellar interferometry. I won't get into the specifics of the technique because it gets fairly technical. Uh, this, this was uh, the woman who really pioneered this work or did the vast majority of this work uh, to sort of prove the, uh, for really be able to use it as a uh, method for determining the size of stars was Dr. Tabby Boyajian. And this is a direct measurement. Of the, of the size of a star. You can use it to, um, you can actually literally measure the 
at uh, the angle the star subtends on the sky. And from that, you can get a linear distance, if you, linear size if you know the distance to that star. The technique may not be trivial, but once you get the once you get the data from the technique, getting the dist or getting the size is actually fairly trivial. Prior to that, there were only two techniques to that were used to determine the size of stars, and even today, these are the workhorse methods. There is a uh, there is a wow. Why am I blanking on this? Um, there is a very indirect one, uh, way, and that, that is using the Stefan-Boltzmann relationship, or that the luminosity of a star is equal to 4 pi, the radius of the star, times the uh, radius of the star squared, times the temperature of the star, uh, star to the fourth power. And so if you know the intrinsic luminosity of the star and you know the temperature of the star, you can then calculate its radius. But there again, you need to know essentially two different quantities, and um, and those quantities are arrived at through, uh, I wouldn't say circuitous methods, but um, through multiple different stages. So the, St the, St uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law is a good method to use if the star is a single star uh, and it is too far away for stellar uh, stellar interferometry. The other workhorse method, and this is really the uh, the way that we really I think this is the way that most of the masses uh, most of the radii of stars is determined, and also masses are through binary stars. Now I'm going to take a moment uh, to when we uh, get to the particular type of uh, binary is an eclipsing binary. And so I will revisit this subject when we get to the uh, eclipsing binary. But sort of as a segue or transition, digression, whatever, uh, you have that, uh, how do we get stellar mass? How do we know how something, how massive something is or how much it weighs? Obviously, we can't put it on a scale, so how do we do this? And again, this is the, these are the workhorse methods that we use. To understand this, we have to understand the idea of a center of mass. So every object has a center of mass. This has a center of mass. Uh, what a center of mass is, is the position in that object, if you were to squash all of that mass down proportionally to a, uh, to a point. Now with stars, what we can do is we can, um, we can conceptualize this as two essentially point sources, or two very, very uh, small in radius objects, and these two stars are in a binary system where they are orbiting around each other. Why are they orbiting around each other? They are orbiting around a center of mass. And that is the center, position of the center of mass is determined by the masses of the two objects. The center of mass shifts towards the more massive of the two objects, of the two stars. So if you have two stars of equal mass, they orbit around in a, um, basically, the center of mass is directly in between them. If one is far more massive than the other one, then basically you have, mm, I can do it, there we go, something like, uh, something of that nature. The sun, for example, the sun doesn't sit absolutely in space. Um, it doesn't have a fixed position in space, or at least fixed in relation to the uh, solar system. It actually wobbles. If you were to look on over the uh, some look over the solar system, and look down on it, and you were to measure the point of the, the sun relative to say the, st uh, the stars, because of the influence of the uh, rest of the planets, it actually wobbles in something of a, a rather complicated way. But it the center of mass sometimes actually is farther uh, is farther and uh, far enough away that it's actually beyond the um, beyond the surface of the sun for the most part it is actually located within the sun so that's why it doesn't appear to really move now what does this have to do with the the price of tea in China well as I said um, depending on the center of mass uh, you're going to have uh, that's, or depending on the masses of the things involved, that's going to shift uh, the center of mass closer to one star to the other. 
And we can then use uh, Kepler's law, um, Kepler's particularly the harmonic law, Newton's revision of it, where you have period squared is equal to uh, 2 pi uh, a cubed, or semi-major axis cubed, divided by the sum of the masses. And so from there you can get the, the sum of the, the masses of these two objects. Now, how do we get, say, the period is fairly obvious. We, if we can measure where these two stars, uh, how long it takes for these two stars to go around each other, that gets at the period. But how do we get the semi-major axis? How do we get how the position away from each other? And we can get that through the velocity. We can use spectrum in, in uh, combination with the Doppler effect, which is similar to the Doppler effect of sound. What this, uh, in, in practice, what the Doppler effect does for us is that if a star is moving towards us, um, then it's the, the spectral lines in that spectra are going to shift to the bluer end of the, of the spectrum. If it's moving away from us, or that's referred to as a blue shift. If it's moving away from us, that's a red shift. That shift is directly proportional to the velocity. So the larger the shift, the, lo the faster that object is moving. And we get something known as a velocity curve from it. So that is what the, the plot at the bottom uh, illustrates, is that you have a Doppler velocity um, as a function of time. The red star, because it is further out, is moving at a much faster rate than the blue star at the center. In order to really, uh, the best way to conceptualize this is both stars have to move around the, the, the center of mass uh, with the same period because they are basically sort of joined to each other. And so the clo closer the star is to the center of mass, the less distance it has to travel. The farther away it is, the more distance it has to travel, so the faster it has to go in order to keep that period consistent. And so when we look at, let's say and so a lot, when we look at the spectrum, if we are, if we are lucky enough, we can actually look at the spectrum, we can see the spectral lines from each individual star and they're superimposed on each other. And so one shifts a little bit, one the other one shifts quite a bit, and we can uh, create that curve at the bottom, which is the velocity uh, from the shifts uh, as a function of time. The red is obviously going faster than the, uh, the other. And from, these, uh, from the velocity, you can then get the distances from the star, uh, and then from there you can uh, get the, the total masses of the star. Now, this is, um, so there are, I'm going to go over ultimately three types of, of binaries, of binary stars. We have visual binaries. Now, a visual binary um, is one of two phenomena. Now, a visual, uh, visual binary is two stars which appear to be very close together uh, in the sky. Now, two things could be happening here. This could be a chance alignment. These two stars could be very far away from each other, uh, not connected gravitationally in any way whatsoever. It just happens that they basically align and appear to us to be very, very close to each other. The other thing that could be happening is that these, this is an ex extremely wide binary, or extremely wide separation binary. The two stars are, in fact, gravitationally bound to each other. But they're, move, uh, but they're so far away from the center of mass that they're moving very, very slowly. The periods of these, of these stars can be in the hundreds, if not thousands, uh, tens of, thousands or tens of thousands of years. And the Navy is actually very interested in figuring this, uh, figuring out whether or not visual binaries are one or the other, I guess navigation or some such thing. Anyway, th those are visual binaries. They can either be not gravitationally bound or not... Um, connected in any way, or they can just be very, very large separation binaries that are moving around each other very, very slowly. Then you have spectroscopic binaries, and that's ultimately what I was talking about before. You get a spectra of the star, and you notice uh, the, the shift of the lines of that star, of that absorption spectrum moving left to right, and you get from that the, the velocities and yada yada. Then we get then we come to eclipsing binary stars. Now, let me go back to the radii. The radius of a star um, can be found through an eclipsing binary.
Now the radius um, can be the radius. You can what's happening here is that the alignment of the of these two stars. So again, we have a binary is two stars orbiting around a common center of mass. The, that inclination can be random to us. There is no preferred inclination to us. So there is a chance that that situation could be that they are orbiting around each other um, that flat on to the point that one star actually passes in front of the other and vice versa. How do we see this? How do we determine that this uh, something is an eclipsing binary? Is we look at how much uh, what the light is doing over time. We use photometry to look at the brightness of this apparently single object over time. And what we'll see is that if the uh, if the f f dimmer star moves in front of the hotter star, we notice a diminution of light, a smaller, uh, a relatively small diminution of light. Um, and that is ultimately because if outside of eclipse, when the two stars are by the uh, are separated from each other, again we only see them as one. But if they're separated from one another, then the star has um, star the combined system has a certain amount of brightness. The two stars are, um, but as one passes in front of the other one, one star is going to be blocking out a certain amount of light based on its size and its area, or its size and therefore its area. If the dimmer one is uh, blocking in front, it is uh, it is blocking out uh, and only replacing a little bit of amount of uh, a little bit amount of light. So instead of seeing the light from that region at its full glory, you are having that that component moving in front of it, blocking out the star, the brighter star's light, and replacing it with its own intrinsic light. And then as time progresses, the, the, the radio or the star moves out of the way. If you, the size of that dip, it corresponds to the, or characteristics of that dip correspond to the radii of the star. Might, and now we get to, uh, as we progress, the star moves out in front of the, uh, away from the star, the cooler star moves away from the star, it, uh, the the intensity is uh, returns to the normal or uh, typical limit of the combined light. Then the uh, dimmer star actually moves in front and, or behind, and what we have is that that star is completely gone, and we lose all of the light from that star, and you get a what we refer to as a primary eclipse or primary dip. And that repeats over and over again. So, if we want to get the two probably most, in my opinion, two fundamentally important quantities of a star, its mass and its radii, then the best way to do this is to look at a binary system that is both spectroscopic and eclipsing. Because from that, spectroscopic binary gives you the mass, a... Um, binary system gives you the radius and bing bang boom you have uh, what you need which brings us to one of my favorite things in astronomy the HR diagram or Hertzsprung Russell diagram now the uh, two astronomers I don't know really the the history behind this but I can imagine that these two astronomers sat around one day smoking pipes and they said ah what happens if we take all, we have a whole bunch of measurements of how intrinsic bright these, these stars are, and we know the temperatures of these stars. So what if we just plot them up as a function of one another and see what we see? And so they plotted the luminosity on the y-axis, and for a reason that completely escapes me, they plotted the temperature on the x-axis, but backwards. So instead of the uh, temperature increasing as you move away from the origin, it actually de uh, actually decreases when you move away from the origin. Uh, I don't know. Again, uh, maybe there's something else in the, in, the, in the pipe other than tobacco. Got me. So when you look at the uh, HR diagram, what you, we notice is that there are that stars group in certain regions. And that is vital to our understanding of stellar evolution. We, this tells us that a star, particularly when we look at clusters of stars, which we can assume are all born in or about the same time, 
these these stars will move or evolve they will change brightness and radii over time uh, it's really the we can again we can see this through different clusters in uh, a certain cluster will have a large amount of what we refer to as a main sequence star and a smaller amount of giants and then other ones will uh, be the opposite they'll have a smaller number of main sequence and a larger number of giants so let's look at the these individual regions in in particular the hr diagram um, the, the probably the most prominent feature of the HR diagram. And what I mean by prominent is the, the region of the diagram that contains the most stars with respect to uh, any other region is referred to as the main sequence. These are, to anthropomorphize stars, these are stars, uh, these are adult stars. These are, this is the period of time in a star's life that it spends the most time in. For example, the sun, it, uh, we typically say that the sun will ha has an age or has a lifespan of around 10 billion years old. Most of that, the vast majority of that, is spent on the main sequence. When we look at um, the definition of a main sequence star, the definition of, a ma of, of one of these adult stars is simply whether or not hydrogen is burning into helium through nuclear fusion in the core. If it's not doing that, it's not on the main sequence. Uh, as it goes through various uh, ev stages of evolution, uh, the core will actually burn different elements into other different elements, or in terms of white dwarfs, there will be no nuclear fusion at all uh, happening in that star. So that is the definition of a main sequence. Hydrogen is burning the helium uh, in, the, in, the, yada yada, in the core of those stars. Now, there are certain relationships which hold with the main sequence, not all of which hold for all stars. Um, now, one of the relationships that really holds for all stars, but with the main sequence, we can definitely see a linear path of stars in the upper left are hotter, brighter, and larger. Stars in the bottom right, uh, so these are your O stars. The ones on the bottom right are your M stars that are cooler, they are they're cooler, they are fainter, and they are smaller. One, um, one property of the main sequence that holds only for the main sequence and no other part of the HR diagram is that the main sequence is also a function of mass. So the, in the upper left, we have the hotter star, these stars are hottest, they are the most luminous, they are the largest in radii, and they are also the largest in mass. And as you move towards the lower right, uh, the masses of these stars get smaller and smaller. Um, the range is um, around, for most stars, most of these classifications, is around 60 times the mass of the, the sun for, oh, five stars. And then um, basically 8% of the mass of the sun. 8% of the mass of the sun at the lowest range of M dwarfs. Or an M5 is 20% uh, of the mass of the sun. That, again, only holds for main sequence. You cannot say the same thing in terms of mass for giant stars or white dwarfs. For giant stars, you can't. Um, actually, it does hold for, for white dwarfs, but it's a little bit more. Uh, it's a different type of function. So as I specified before, the next rung, or a next rung in the uh, in the cosmic distance ladder is known as spectroscopic uh, parallax. So what we can do is we can use the HR spectra, uh, HR uh, diagram to uh, to determine the intrinsic luminosity based on the star's spectral type and we know how bright it is in the night sky and so that lumina if you know the intrinsic luminosity you know the apparent brightness then you have the distance and this is again known as uh, spectroscopic binary uh, spectroscopic parallax a point that i would like to make now is when we talk about stellar evolution i'm sure i'm going to come back to this 
When we talk about stellar evolution, there is really only one quantity that determines all of it. Determines how fast it happens, it determines what they evolve into, uh, how they do so, yeah, uh, so forth and so on. And that is its mass. Mass is the key driver of these things. A secondary, much smaller secondary component is the stellar composition. How, mu how many metals? Uh, oh, and astronomers are lazy. There is hydrogen, there is helium, and then everything else is a metal. Um, so yeah, oxygen to an astronomer, that's a metal. Uh, so depending on the metallicity, how much, uh, how the abundance of the heavier elements within that star, that will also affect the evolution of these stars. But, said, the primary driver is mass. I mentioned before the, uh, we have the and we have the spectra type, but more generally we have a MK type, which includes the, spectra, uh, the spectral type, like O5, uh, G, G2, M5, so forth. But we also incorporate, the MK part of it, incorporates the luminosity of the star. Because as you can see, hopefully you can see from the HR diagram, um, let's go back to that one, that one. Let's look at, say, the sun. The sun is a G2 star. Now, if you move up, you can find stars that have the exact same surface temperature that are far more luminous. What this means is that the star is much larger and it happens to be in an evolved state. So the spectral type doesn't quite tell you a whole story. You need to know what we refer to as luminosity class. And we define very roughly uh, the luminosity class is 1, 3, and 5. Uh, 1 are supergiants, 3 are giants, uh, 5 are main sequence stars. You do also have 2 and 4, but these are intermediate stages between, the, uh, between these main uh, 1, 3, and 5. Obviously, uh, luminosities of one, two are much brighter, or much higher than luminosity or luminosities of uh, dwarf stars or five star, four and five stars. So, when if you want the complete, uh, well, somewhat complete uh, story about our sun, our sun is a G two five star. It is a uh, G25, that tells you what the lumina or what the temperature and luminosity is, and then the five star, well, that tells you what the temperature is, and then the five tells you what the luminosity is. So this is just a summary of um, the measurements of stars that I've uh, talked about in this lecture, and uh, that is it. That is basically how I uh, that is all that I'm going to uh, talk about uh, in this lecture. And just to remind you that science is a collaboration. That we have, that it takes multiple people working together in order to essentially link these, these concepts together in order to find new concepts. Like I said, Hertzsprung and Russell uh, joined together, collaborated to create the diagram, and those led to... Um, that led to our understanding of stellar, uh, stellar evolution, and any count and uh, the HR diagram can only be created because of Annie Jump Cannon's contribution, the, the way that she discovered or she classified these stars based on their temperature and so forth. I am actually I lied. I am going to throw a little bit of math at you. So. For those of you who are interested in the mathematics behind this, uh, please uh, stay. Uh, please stay with me. I know this lecture is getting a little long, but um, like I said this is when we look at parallax and distance. Uh, parallactic angle is measured in arc seconds. What is an arc second? Uh, there are. Uh, it's effectively one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. So if you take a degree, subtended on the sky and you split that degree into 60 equal segments. Those 60 equal segments are arc minutes. To give you a sense of scale, the full moon is 30 arc minutes, or half a degree, in size. 
Then you take one of those, those slices, you take that moon, and you split it up into 30. So, really, in actual fact, if you take an, um, if you take an arc minute, I should say, if you take an arc minute, and you split that into 60 equal segments, then you get an arc second. So, yeah, so you take one sliver of one thirtieth of the width of the the moon, and you split that into 60 equal segments. Each one of those segments is an arc second. A parallax, a par, par, parsec, so I don't know why I'm getting that confused. A parsec, again, is the distance that, let me back that up, if a star subtends or moves from left to right with a parallactic angle of one arc second, then it is one parsec from us. It is defined that way. One parsec is parallactic angle of one arc second. So, parsec. We measure that, uh, when we put that into more common units, we get um, that one parsec is equal to 260,000 uh, AU. Again, AU is the astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, or 149 million kilometers. But more generally speaking, a parsec is, uh, is 3.26 light years. So when we have, when we say that the closest star is Alpha Centauri, or really Proxima Centauri, at four light years, what we're saying is that the, the parallactic angle of uh, Alpha Centauri is about three quarters of an arc second. It is the largest parallactic angle that we can measure. So it's the easiest that we can see. So when we look at the, uh, the brightnesses of things, as I mentioned before, you have apparent uh, brightness can be stated as apparent magnitude, and luminosity can be stated as absolute magnitude. Now, where did this system come uh, came from? This system, we can thank this system we can thank Hipparchus, an ancient Greek astronomer, uh, for this system. Why we kept it, I'm not entirely certain, because it's kind of counterintuitive. What Hipparchus did was, all right, I'm going to catalog the entire sky. Not only am I going to f determine the positions of all the stars in the sky relative to each other, I am going to determine the brightnesses of the stars relative to each other. And what he did, well, it's very crude, but what he did was he said, all right, all the brightest stars in that sky, I'm going to classify as first magnitude. All of the dimmest stars in the night sky, the ones I can barely see, are sixth magnitude. And that generally holds today. Um, depending on the, your, on the quality of your eyesight, um, your, the faintest star that you can see is roughly sixth magnitude. You might be able to see a little dimmer than that, but or not. So that's the range, of, and then all the other stars fell into um, fell into in between. Around 1800s or so, uh, a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Pogson uh, came, came in and he threw math at it. He was like, all right, this magnitude system's nice, but it's really kind of subjective. Let me see if I can throw some math at it. And so what he said was that the difference in magnitude between two stars is equal to um, 2.5 times the logarithm of the fluxes, or how much brightness you're getting from one star in comparison to the other. Not simply put, but what we can, um, sort of in context, what that says is that the a difference of five magnitudes from fifth to sixth is a hundred times in brightness. So a first magnitude star is a hundred times brighter than a sixth magnitude star. He just defined it that way. And we kept it, and we can uh, extract. And using that, uh, using that formulation, we can then determine uh, the brightnesses in a more quantitative way in the night sky. So, the reason why it's counterintuitive is that the smaller the magnitude, the brighter something is. The larger the magnitude, the dimmer it is. So, for example, because we have this, we have this numerical system now we can quantify what the sun's brightness is, because obviously the sun is brighter than first magnitude. What we find is that the sun actually has a brightness of around negative 27. Uh, the full moon is about negative 13. 
uh, the naked eye limit is like I said is or Polaris the North Star which is not the brightest star in the sky has a magnitude around two ish um, uh, the naked eye limit is six and then when we talk about the the fainter end of this uh, of the spectrum the Hubble Space Telescope its faintest limit its brightness limit is around 30 mag 30th magnitude so really really dim. Now again, uh, when we estimate the, um, the sizes of stars, what we have is the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is uh, luminosity is equal to four, four pi times uh, the r squared. I forgot earlier that the, the, there is a Stefan Boltzmann constant uh, times the temperature to the fourth power. Uh, the units for this are, depending on which units you use for radius and temperature, the, the units for this are watts or joules per second. And you can rearrange this equation so that you can get uh, an R based on luminosity and temperature. Really, what, what I want to sort of stress is, and I probably should have stressed it before the one hour, 15 minute mark, is that when it comes to luminosity, luminosity is a fairly steep function of, of radius. If you square, if you double the size of the star, the luminosity of the star goes up by um, goes up by a factor of four. But it's a much steeper function of temperature. If you double the temperature of the star, the, lumino the, uh, the luminosity goes up by 16 times. So, again, this is, uh, so in terms of, of luminosities, when you see the intrinsic luminosity of the star, um, there is a sort of degeneracy between temperature and, and radius. If you, um, two stars can be, have the same luminosity, but not the same surface temperature because the radii, uh, because of difference of radii, depending on what the radii are. When we look at the um, measurement of, of eclipsing binaries or eclipsing and spectroscopic binary, again, the we show uh, we see the the Doppler effect, uh, Doppler curve or radial velocity curve as we call it, um, and we take we have individual points. We have individual observations. Each of these observations is at one particular spectra. And then we fit a curve to that. Uh, most simple, the simplest curve is a sine wave. And the amplitude of that sine wave tells us the, basically the velocity, the, the highest velocity that the star is, um, or the velocity at the point which it's directly moving away from us. Uh, really the velocity, the, the velocity of the star moving, or the speed of the star as it, as it goes around its orbit. That can be, that can be transferred over to the, the semi-major axis of the star, because again, as I mentioned before, the farther something is away, the faster it's going to be moving. And again, we can, uh, with spectroscopic binaries, we can see, and eclipsing binaries, we can see the, the patterns, either the shifting of the lines or the dips um, we can see that uh, repeat, and when the time it takes for those to repeat, that gives you the period. We can then use Newton's uh, formulation of the Kepler's harmonic law, which states, and I knew there was a G in there, so I got that one wrong earlier. Again, great to notice at the one hour, 18 minute mark, that the period uh, uh, squared of, the, of an object, of a star is equal to, of a binary star is equal to four pi squared it's semi-major axis cubed divided by the um, gravitational constant times the mass, the total mass of the star. And from there, you can um, you can piece out what the uh, you can you can rewrite that equation, and now you have uh, the ma the individual mass components. And then going back to the spectroscopic binary again, the velocity of that star is directly related to the force acting on the star as it's that's causing it to spin around the force then tells you what the um, the uh, force is related to acceleration times mass and you get the mass uh, from for the, each individual component and uh yeah so you can then tease out what the uh, the mat if you can if you can get the, the velocity of one you can get uh, then get the uh, the mass of each individual thing.
All right, now I think this lecture has gone on long enough, and uh, so I'm going to stop it here. And uh, and I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. At least you, I really hope you found this lecture to be um, educational. And uh, yeah, I will see you next time, uh, hopefully tomorrow, with uh, the next lecture in this series. So for now, peace out.